my producers were proud of me last week. I said the word connect the most times of anybody ever in a webinar introduction. And so the Guinness Book of World Records called right after. And so again, producers were happy and won't kick me off the air um, for repeating words like that because you know being in the Guinness Book of World Records was kind of cool. So anyway, for those that joined, it was fun last week. It was my first time doing a, a live virtual panel and you guys stayed patient and the panel was amazing. They, they picked up where, where I couldn't and gave really cool solutions. So this week we're going to start another conversation, and you'll understand why I use that word, um, you know, here momentarily. But we're going to start another conversation about a topic that not only our industry, but frankly the world at large, is interested and curious and cares about, and that's service and food and beverage. And to be clear, the topic and the overall climate are evolving every day, every hour. Yes, the the COVID nineteen situation has presented us with unique ebbs and flows. And we're all collectively educated enough and understand enough, are patient enough to realize that what's true today might change tomorrow. And so guidelines from local, state, government sources, and hopefully eventually a vaccine will largely guide a lot of our important decisions moving forward in the coming months and in years. But in, as such, the conversation today is gonna be much like an icebreaker. It's gonna be a macro view at some of the questions that we all have and some of the solutions and the opportunities we might consider. ALSD hopes to cover this topic in a, a series of sorts as well for, for those reasons, ebbing and flowing, right along with the climate itself. And so we'd ask you to stay tuned for more on that. And you know, today I would like to point out that you know, our, our panelists, they're all near and dear to my heart. A, a lot of you know most of them and will after this panel today, but we're appreciative of them kicking off this conversation with us. You know, each brings a level of expertise and certainly long tenured experience, uh, allowing for a discussion on high level concepts and general guidance with the underpinned fluid situation in mind. If you'd like to connect with any of the three after this webinar, please feel free to do so. We encourage you to do so. And finally, two notes. Um, just to reiterate what Jared and I spoke about on last week's and the, the week before panels, ALSD now has a, a, a large gathering of information on our website and resources for you all. One, if you'd like to learn more about those resources or have ideas on what else we could be doing, email me. Simple email, amanda at alsd.com. And many of you have, you know, phone numbers now. Certainly my cell phone is what we'll be using here moving forward. And second, next week's panel will be on multi-use and flexibility in today's venues. We'll address technology and also memorable experiences for when our venues reopen, which it will be an exciting time for a lot of us. So with that, I want to dive into today's panel. I don't want to be the one talking all day. I'd like, I'd like our group to do so. So before we jump into the questions themselves and a, a regurgitation of the prompt, I want each panelist to introduce herself or himself. And so we'll start order. Bigelow, if you'd like to go first, that would be great. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, I will say I found out a little while ago why they invited me because Amanda thought I was around for the Spanish flu at the uh, turn of the two centuries ago. So I'm trying to put those rumors to rest, but- You were? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, now, you see, now I don't even remember what I did. I've, I've been uh, consulting with stadiums and arenas, convention centers uh, for over 30 years now and, and working in the food and beverage uh, side of the business, both on the equipment side and also the management consulting side and a member of ALSD uh, for a long, long time. Uh, thanks very much. We won't give the number of years, but no. we appreciate your service, sir. All right, Tracy, you're up. Hi, I'm Tracy Stuckrath, um, and I am a speaker and consultant and trainer on food and beverage as it relates to inclusion and safety. Um, I've been a meeting planner for 30 years, and then I got diagnosed with a food allergy. And I couldn't eat at my own events. So I took that opportunity to start a business to educate food service providers um, at meetings and hotels, convention centers, anywhere um, on how to accommodate people with different dietary restrictions, whether it's food allergies or being a vegan or having religious based practices. So that's what I do. Thanks, Tracy. Glad to have you. Mike. 
Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate the opportunity to put a shirt on today. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, so you say all you can do. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm uh, Mike Platino. I'm the uh, founder of Food Service Matters. Uh, spent uh, spent my life in food and beverage, and for the past seven years, we've been advocates and advisors to uh, sports teams and venues uh, around the country, providing a wide range of advice and uh, and services. But uh, happy to be here today. Thanks, everybody. As a reminder, today's panel will generally address uh, the prompt that I'll read here. Again, setting the table for a shift in service. When our venues open again, the way we provide customer service, in particular food and beverage, will be different. While we don't yet have all the answers or the plans in place, we've started to compile the questions. Let's outline those and other venue operation and presentation factors to consider in order to provide a high level of service along with a renewed sense of safety and well-being upon return. And so with that, I think the, the most fitting first question to ask the entire panel, I think those that are listening, and frankly, the panel and, and myself included, want to know what the new normal will look like. And we currently don't have you know, our eyes on that crystal ball, but I'd like to give each panelist a chance to introduce some of the ideas that they think could be part of the new normal. So Chris, starting with you, you know, lead us into to some of the new norms like um, less self-service, more certified F&B reps, fewer buffets, things like that. Yeah, I, I think uh, when our customers come back, they are going to ask a lot of questions and how a product's prepared, how it's served. You know, the whole concept of help yourself to a buffet, I think those days are limited, certainly uh, in the early years where things will be served. You may have a buffet for uh, viewing, but the food would actually be served by a food service uh representative or a chef. Uh, likewise, you're going to see a lot of things that, and, and operators always wanted to get away from the prepackaged, covered up, hermetically sealed salads and that type of thing. But I think you're going to see going back to that. And even, if, you know, grab and go concepts and all that, where you're selling packaged products uh, that can be controlled in, in a controlled environment like a kitchen. So the customer will have less interaction with that food. Yeah, that makes sense. You obviously have been a member of our association, which, which is premium and focuses on premium seating and premium F&B for, for several years now. Is there any, anything specific to premium that you might be able to point out or that we should be at least looking at right now in terms of warmers, chapers, platters, prepackaged? You already mentioned some of it, but is there anything further in premium? Well, one, and it's really a question more than anything is a lot of this is going to come down to local health departments. So we're not going to see any type of uniform. I think this pandemic has shown us we're never going to have any uniform anything, but we're going to have individual answers. And it would not surprise me if there are health departments out there that will not allow uh, shaving dishes, uh, induction warmers and all that for self-service, even in a suite you know, where it's a controlled 20 people that, that, you know, you know, supposedly, I think until we get past all this, you may see that that isn't going to be allowed. So again, prepackaged items uh, could become the norm. So Tracy, again, you, you come to us uh, from in different industries. You might have, I don't know, a different perception or at least different experiences that you can bring into sports, if you will. So just depend some of your own thoughts to Chris's about what that new norm might look like in events overall. I mean, I, I agree with Chris on the buffets and, and how are we going to limit those? And even, you know, when you go through a buffet, you don't know who's touching it currently, right? Or who was before you that ate off of it. So can you institute sneeze guards? But I, I definitely think picking up tongs and the next person down the aisle picking up those tongs, you're gonna to wanna to have that server doing it. So I kind of agree with that. If you're, and especially in that suite environment, you already have a limited amount of space. And so if you're looking at it, maybe you're in the club level and you've got a lot more space, but does that buffet, instead of being just two six foot tables, is it now four six foot tables? So the chafing dishes are further apart um, to, to, to entice social distancing. My, I prepackaged food. I I agree with on a lot of this pack. You know, a lot of the sense of that. But I also want you to pay attention to what's in that prepackaged food because 
it also takes it back to not really non-healthy food. Um, but if you are going to do prepackaged, I'd also suggest looking at making sure that you have options that are free from so that you're not just serving the regular crackers with peanut butter in them. Do you have, you know, peanut free crackers? Do you have um, other vegan options? You can get a really a lot of different vegan certified vegan options. So I think looking at that aspect of it too, when you're purchasing them, but I definitely think, and even if you're self-serve drinks, right? Water coolers, we were going trying to get away from water bottles. Nobody's going to want to touch a cooler spigot, you know, so going back to water bottles, unfortunately. So I think this is also an opportunity to up your sustainability efforts. How are you going to recycle all that plastic from the prepackaged food? And what about from the bottled water, things like that? So yeah, you bring up a lot of good points. And something that you and I were talking about on a call earlier this week, when we go back into our venues, we all have to consider as suite, club, loge, um, full-time, but also hourly staffs, so we're all going to get asked a lot of questions from our guests that we're mm -hmm. going to want to know how to answer. And certainly we'll get into to staffing and protocols and procedures a little bit later, but dig into that a little bit for me, Tracy, on some of the questions that our guests might be asking us now. They're going to want to know, when did you clean that surface? You know, when was the last time that you actually cleaned the suite? Um, and what the the service personnel are going to be asked those questions and they're going to be asked where does the food come from how did you source it i saw something today about our loading dock you know um area is going to be changed as well for social distancing how is that food going to be brought in and and when was it cleaned and how was it cleaned so i think you know, typically that front of house meeting was an hour before the venue opened, things like that. How can you get them in and educate them on what your cleaning practices are so that you can let the, the main suite person have that information, but also be able to pass it on to the, the other guests that are in the suite? Yeah, you bring up several good points there and I appreciate that. Uh, Mike, as mentioned, the current situation is going to continue to evolve, but you used a word the other day that I thought was a, a really good one. It provides us the impetus to think about the future. So tell us more about what your thoughts are there. Yeah, you know, certainly Tracy and, and Chris hit on a lot of the uh, sanitation related topics, which we know are are top of the list and, and are, are, are going to be at the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, we, we see this a little bit maybe broader and, and maybe with a little more optimism that it's going to, uh, there's going to be other components that are going to be uh, valuable and in some cases opportunities that, that maybe we're slow to move, but uh, we'll now have a little more of a, of a reason to push them forward. I know we're going to talk about what that means from a technology perspective. Uh, I know we're going to talk more about what it means from a, 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 how, we, how we support local restaurants and and become the the uh, um, uh, the, the the mentor in a in a in a community and and, and help get folks back. Um, you know, certainly on the on the sanitation side, as as equal as uh, and then we're going to talk more about uh, staffing and training. But as equally as important as it's going to be for guests to feel secure, it's going to be just as important for our staff to feel secure. And, and what does that mean? So. You know, we, we've got on, on our list probably five or six or seven things that we think encompass, uh, and everyone's getting probably tired of hearing the new norm, but until we have a better way of describing it, uh, we think there's uh, several components to what the new norm is, and, uh, and some are, let's, let's take advantage of this time to, to rethink some things that we just didn't have the time for, or the timing in the world wasn't right. Everything from pricing to value perception, which is code for pricing, uh, right down the list. Let's take a look at it. We've had buildings empty for uh, a month now and could be three or four months. I think teams and venues are going to think differently about making an extra couple of dollars on a, a hot dog or hamburger, maybe, but we'll find out. Sure. I appreciate that, Mike. Thanks for bringing that up. One of the things that I think we should be and a lot of us are thinking about right now is presentation. You know, a lot of us come again in the audience here and on the panel today from premium. And so we want to know, you know, a level of sophistication still has to be in our suites and our clubs and our loges, but we have to take into consideration now the sanitation, sanitation that we brought up and, and safety um, in our last little question series. But I'd like to stay on that topic of presentation. And Tracy, as mentioned, you come to us from several different industries, including large meetings and events. 
you know, across industries, though, there is going to be that universal desire for that sophistication and elegance in our presentations. So as we think about both that and the sanitation, you know, would you be able to offer any guidance of how to, to deliver both of those things? I mean, one chef that I got an email from the other day was talking about how he's actually having conversations with the senior living community and looking how they present their food in that safety perspective of that. And, and, and then I went and Googled, and I'm sure Facebook now has got sneeze guards running down ads down my Facebook feed because I've been Googling the crap out of them. But, you know, there are portable sneeze guards, and how do you do that? They can look nice and not, you know, cheesy. So doing that, but, you know, your servers in those areas, you know, they still dress nice. How can you um, present it? And one chef too said, no more donut walls and no more pretzel walls. How do you, but how do you still do that nice presentation with that level of sanitation? And I think that goes back to what Chris said is, we have to look at the service levels of that. Of, uh, who are the people giving the food, serving the food to you? Nobody's going to want to um, eat off of a plated um, past hors d'oeuvre right now. You know, how do you present that differently with some safety precautions in that? And I think it's just thinking about talking to caterers who have done presentations outside of an arena in, in a tent. You know, what are they doing? I, and actually, I'm trying to get a hold of the guy that does the governor's ball for the Emmys. How are they going to do those different catering buffets that they have, those different presentations. And I think looking at that food and beverage providers from all aspects need to work together to figure out how can we do this together um, to, to share ideas. Well, I think you brought up a really interesting point that, that our industry in sports could be looking at other industries. I find it fascinating the the senior living um, facilities that you point out have an, an older, um, typically, and a uh, perhaps more at risk demographics. So they already had stricter protocols in place. Right. And so certainly we can't get into to, to those facilities right now, but we can take cues from them. And I think the restaurant industry overall will see the evolution together as a group here. But great points that you brought up there. Mike, why don't you continue with that? Yeah, you, you know, I think on the on the premium side, there's probably, you know, let me back up. I think I think on the concession side, uh, not that difficult to picture some of the, the immediate changes we're going to need to make. Um, I, I think the premium side is uh, a, a little more elusive to figure out wh what that's going to look like today uh, and what it's going to look like in the short term and what's going to stick. You know, we, we know we know there are going to be differences of what happens hopefully in August, September, October, November, December, and what a year from now is going to be the real new norm. Um, but on the premium side, it's, it's going to be interesting. You know, is is a suite going to have any food when you walk in, or is it just going to be all covered when you walk in? You know, I I don't I don't think we've I I haven't figured that out yet, and uh, uh, Mr. Bigelow may have all the answers. So uh, hopefully, he can take us home here. Take us home, Chris. Tell us a little bit about you know. I think that that consumers are also going to understand that fine dining and that, that that word sophistication may take on a bit of a different meaning now because they might want their food covered. They might want more uh, sanita san sanitized um, areas that are they're, they're being served off of. So even, even though, yes, we do have a desire for the elegant, tell us what you think might change and what people might be okay with. Well, I, again, I think we're just, we're, we're hitting all these things, but I mean, it's going to get down to things as simple as at a banquet or in a club where they come in, what's on the table before they get there. Salt and pepper, pre-poured water glasses, bread and butter, none of that's going to be on that table. It all has to be served by a server. So, I mean, it's even, it's just those minute things like that that you don't think about that unfortunately probably is going to make the presentation look a lot more drab. Uh, you know, hopefully the food's good, but at the end of the day, it's also going to be more labor intensive. It has to be because you're, you're eliminating the whole, self-service concept. I mean, one of the things, you know, Mike mentioned concessions and everybody was going to uh, ordering kiosk and all that. And, you know, you start wondering, okay, if every customer punches that screen to pay for their order and get it delivered, yeah, there may be less employees, but how are we going to keep the ordering screen clean? So, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you're just going to have to think through every step 
of service. What about protect personal protective equipment? Is that going to be pretty normal for, for service to perhaps have masks, at least for the foreseeable future, any more, uh, not just the hairnets uh, of old, but gloves and, and masks and things like that? Uh, well, I, I think it will certainly be more normal. I think it'll be a little off-putting when you go in a restaurant and everybody's masked. I was at a, uh, in LA, this is three weeks ago, I guess, and it was a dim sum restaurant. They were pushing the carts around. All the servers had a uh, plastic uh, face mask on uh, doing that. You certainly start thinking about, well, what am I eating? You know, and, and what's going on? So, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I think it's going to happen and people won't think it's that odd to see it. But again, it, you know, the whole idea of hospitality and making people feel comfortable and all that, uh, again, I think it's a, it is a new reality. Yeah, I would agree. And I want to stick to what people are, are comfortable with and, and making them feel even more comfortable and jump into food distribution and the use of local. So Tracy, starting with you, we talked a little bit about sourcing, distribution, supply chain, and considering but, but not exclusive to COVID-19, guests are keen to know where their food came from. And I think if we can take the steps, to make them fewer kind of from farm to plate, if you will, that would be ideal. Can you address that topic and certainly bring from the other industries that you've been in? Uh, yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, definitely people are wanting to know what's in their food. They want more transparency, whether it's because of a food allergy that they have or just because they're more environmentally conscious. Um, so how can we utilize our local farmers more? And with everything in the news right now of dairy farmers dumping milk and um, farmers in Florida and California retilling their food into the ground because they don't have the distribution for it, how can we you know, reduce the transportation costs of getting that food to us? And reaching out, I mean, not only for, my, Chris, did you mention those prepackaged food items, what local purveyors do really good food locally that you could actually incorporate that into? So you're bringing that, that local flavor to your stadium as well. That's not just, you know, from a farm, directly from a farm, but can you utilize smaller farmers and some smaller farmers aren't going to have the capacity that we, they can make for a large, you know, football arena, but can you get them from around the area regionally, you know, in the 150 to 200 mile range and, and in helping those farmers? Because right now with all of us not working, the farmers are losing their work as well. So talking to those local farmers, connecting with the ag schools um, that are around and understanding what farmers they work with already. Um, and if you're a university facility that does have an ag school in it, you're already connected. So how can you incorporate that into what you're serving in your stadium? Well, and for stadiums and arenas, the, the idea to, to support local started a long time ago. There's understandably going to be and is probably a resurgence now. And, and Mike, I'll ask you to touch on that particular topic. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. I, I uh, Certainly for the last 10, 12 years, we've, we've been incorporating local brands into different operations. But I think we were doing it for the fans, and I think this time around we'd be we'd be doing it for the local restaurant community that's been so decimated. I, I think the notion of of Big Brother, uh, a FedEx form, uh, you pick the pick the pick the community, but being able to play a bigger role, uh, be that incubator for some, and be that lifeline for others who have been so damaged of all this. So I I'd certainly like to think we have the capacity and the ability, and it's. It'd be on the easy list of things to do to find those 10 restaurants in your community and uh, set them up on a portable and let's not worry about commissions for the first few months and let's not worry about any of the small stuff that we've all learned is small stuff. Um, so we see that as an opportunity to really um, send the right message, do the right thing and, and be, the, uh, be, the, be the bigger player in the, in the mix. So we're, we're, uh, that's something we're talking about a lot. You mentioned to me and, and you know, earlier this week and kind of again just now, we could almost be part of a local restaurant recovery initiative and that we as, as kind of sports and F&B influencers do have a bigger role to play. I really like that philosophy and I think you're right that we do have more to do with the recovery of this uh, perhaps than we even realize. So I appreciate that point. Um, I, I'll ask Chris, you know, to go a little bit further with the local topic, you know, just about every food and beverage uh, in venue was looking at how they could incorporate local 
and you know probably even more so now you obviously talk to a lot of clients that, you know just as the other two do what are you hearing right now about the local okay i'll be the bad guy here i think this is going to hurt the local I, I i get the whole idea of using up local overages down here in florida i mean it's unbelievable what's being left in the field uh and and not being used but from a sanitation, I mean, the good news is, at least as far as I know, they haven't shown any direct link from food to this virus. So it's not like uh, the other uh, issues that we've had in the past, but I think people are gonna be pretty paranoid about what they're eating. And one thing that the larger companies can do is certainly enact higher levels of sanitation and compliance and so when you're buying it, they can certify it, whereas some of the local mom and pop and the local farms aren't gonna be able to do that. So I, I think it's gonna be, from a marketing standpoint and logistics, it's great to use local and people love it, but I think there may be some hesitancy to get too local and get away from the Cisco's of the world or US food service that uh, you know is gonna bring in food from a USDA government inspected uh, plant. So I think that's the one thing that we still have to remember. I think a balance will be met. And I think right now what we heard on a couple calls that I had recently was that one of the other initiatives that people are taking is providing um, carry out or gift cards from their local, whether it's groceries or restaurants or what have you, um, to help them stay in business. Certainly the grocery stores um, are the ones that are doing okay at the moment, but your local ones, your local restaurants, even, even to all of us right now, you could be providing gift cards to there or even to, to the grub hubs of the world that you could order from, you know, somewhere fairly local to you as well. So I think there'll be a balance. Um, and I think it brings up the point of pricing as well. Um, you, you know, what's it going to do to, to premium food and beverage? Do we offer less options um, to our folks as the pricing go up? I don't want to get too deep into the weeds there, but is there any follow-up that you might have there, Chris? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, to be quite honest, I don't think pricing is going to be a big issue for a while. It's going to be more safety. Uh, you know, then they'll worry about it. it. Because I also think people probably for a while will not be eating as much in our venues just out of nervousness of what's going on. And, and again, even though there's been no connection to the food, you still obviously have the people preparing it. So, well, there's the paranoia that you pointed out to. I think yeah. people are going to still monitor this situation and hope that there isn't uh, an issue with the food itself. I think you're exactly right that we'll just be more vigilant of where, you know, this virus in particular goes and others that could be foodborne. Yeah, and I think, you know, you're going to see the venues publicizing whatever their deep cleaning procedures are for the whole building. I just heard a quote from a concessionaire two days ago, 50 cents a square foot is what they were quoted to go into a kitchen uh, to you know, get it really sanitized and everything pulled out. Very expensive process to do that. Uh, and, and it was not because there had been an incident, but their client wanted to be able to say, hey, this is what we've been doing to all our concession stands and kitchens and all that. But at 50 cents a square foot, it's a lot of money price to pay for the perception of safety as well. I think you're right. Our fans are going to require that. And so it's, it's important that we do look into, um, you know, what the, what the, the cost and the risk of not doing it are right now. So let's jump into staffing and training and kind of protocols. Mike, this is a crucial topic when, when we look at our return. What are some of the considerations for educating both our full-time and, and perhaps even more importantly, our frontline personnel? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think before even educating them, we have to make sure we can, we can find them. And we're certainly concerned that uh, there's going to be a lot less of a pool of folks who want to come in for minimum wage or 10 or $12 an hour and be in a, be in a pretty you know, tight concession stand serving hopefully 30, 40, 50,000 people. So uh, what that means to us is that we, we need to open up intentionally uh, with a leaner, a more efficient operation because we're not going to get the 100% staff that we need. And for those businesses that rely heavily on not-for-profit groups, uh, we think that market's going to have dried up for a little bit, that uh, raising money for the, the band or the cheerleading cause really isn't going to be top of mind. And it's going to be in that column of risk that you just don't need to 
uh, be in right now. So, so we're, we're probably mostly concerned about that piece. And then we quickly go to um, how, do we, how do we provide the same level of assurity to the, to the staff and that we're, we're running a great business and that they're gonna be safe here. Um, and what does that look like? And then obviously communicating that with the fan-centric side to customers of all the things collectively we're doing uh, uh, is, is gonna be the challenge, I think. Well, Chris pointed that out in a call I had earlier this week with him as he's saying, you know, look, a lot of these venues, the, the frontline staff isn't even in the venue right now. So that may cause one, some turnover. We may be hiring some new people if we can find those. But when we do at that point, Point, there's a good probability that they may not have the level of training that it's going to take. And my guess is that level of training is, is just going to um, increase and evolve in some way now with, with you know, what's going on. Um, Chris, tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, you know, one of the problems that uh, we're having is, you know, how many people are going to stay at the venue now? I mean, we're getting calls all the time of what's the appropriate staffing right now with no sales. Most of the venues certainly don't have hourly employees who are going to be the employees that are serving. So when this hits, uh, and, and many of them are having to let go supervisory and salary positions as well. You know, when this, when it hits, it says, okay, now we can open. Everybody's going to be scrambling uh, to hire people. Unfortunately, because of the unemployment, it may actually be easier to hire people uh, in the beginning than, than it is prior to this, uh, when everyone was still looking for properly trained employees. So again, part of the training program uh, will emphasize the sanitation and proper handling and you know, uh, even work rules of calling in sick when you don't feel well and all the things that you're hearing about today washing hands and all that, you're going to start seeing that emphasized much more so in training. So I think the training is going to be a much longer process uh, than it had been in the past. You probably saw in the news that uh, uh, Chick-fil-A now has portable hand washers outside in their drive through where they have employees out there. So you're going to see with all the portable stands you know, we used to we used to end up fighting the health department. They always wanted hand washing by a beer stand, where you weren't even handling food. Uh, but I think now, you know, we're certainly not going to be able to argue the point. So I think there's going to be hand washing throughout any venue, whether it's on the suite level, club level, or in the concession level. Uh, again, so that the employee always has access uh, to sanitary measures. For those that aren't familiar, can you tell us what the hazard analysis critical control points is? Yeah, so there is, and, and Tracy may be even smarter on this one than I am, but uh, in, in the hospital world, which is really where it was developed, uh, it's a federal program of guidelines where basically you are tracking your food from the time you purchase it to it gets on the truck to be delivered, uh, and then how you store it and then how you prepare it and finally how you serve it. And it is a monitoring system that when it first came out, again, the only place I saw it actually used was on the hospital side. And some of the uh, national or international concessionaires had it as a corporate policy that they still had to keep logs. And I think some of them still do, but it was kind of, even local health departments didn't know much about it. So it was, kind of one of those things, if nobody's gonna tell me I gotta have my logs that shows the temperature of the product, how long was it out of the refrigerator, off the truck, all those issues, you know, if, if, if you're not gonna measure it, uh, you know, nobody's really gonna monitor the thing. So, but I do think that will come back into play. Uh, and again, in some large, particularly like in a convention center, or some large areas where we have large production kitchens, a stadium too, you know, you, you, some of them have full-time HACCP uh, manager that that's their only job is to track this. There's also a lot of equipment now that will give automatic readouts. So you, you track temperatures. Uh, and so if there is a problem, you know exactly when did the walk-in cooler go down? Uh, you know, when did the freezer stop, start losing temp? Any of that, any of that type of thing. Thanks. 
Tracy, you told us something earlier that I thought was really interesting. And just to reiterate, when we get back in the venues, our guests are going to be asking us questions. Our frontline staff is going to be able to, you know, need to adequately answer some of those questions during the live events. So with that, how might we educate our staffs, um, you know, in an evolving sense, if you will, to, to be able to answer those questions? Certainly, you know, suite attendants and, and people that are, are doing the serving, um, we are not there as full-time employees. We know, you know, because we're in the office, that there's sometimes, um, you know, the line that you can give and you know it maybe a little bit better than the hourly staff who isn't there quite as often. And we want to make sure that we have that consistent universal language that we're using. Can you help us out on that one a little bit? I think, you know, kind of like Chris said too, is can we, you know, I want to say give them some homework before they come in, right? And say, this is our, these are our policies and not if you want to work for us, because we definitely need the staff. And, and even before this happened, we were losing hourly staff to other industries. And so, but making them kind of engaged in wanting to work there, kind of off topic, but I was talking to my niece last night who works at Target and she just became a cashier there. And what she's learning and how to deal with the customers that are coming in. And one lady's like, Hey, do you have a mask that I can have? And she's like, well, you know, and how do you address those questions? You know, train your staff to do that. They gave each of the staff members gift bags. Here's your chapstick. Here's your hand sanitizing station, your own, you know, sanitizing stuff, making them want to come there because it's actually a workplace culture issue. How do you want to encourage them to come and work there? And as Chris said, make sure that they feel safe, you know, working there. And this is what we're doing. But I think providing them that education up front, pulling them in more than an hour before their shift so that they have a little bit more time to do it. Um, we don't like, you know, people on their phones, but, you know, is there an app that the employees have that they can check in on and, and, or is it a chat box or chat bot that they can type in, um, and say, Hey, I need the answer to this. And that goes right to their boss or someone, you know, versus waiting, you know, for how long that boss can come to answer those questions. So I think educating them on the responsibility that they have and the very valid responsibility, and you can see it now in all this COVID stuff, these are frontline workers that have valuable jobs. Let's educate them and teach them that they are a valuable part of this stadium experience, this premium experience. And, and by you understanding this, you elevate what we do and we can elevate who you are. 100%. And it's a philosophy that I think we all... We all keep with us that our frontline staff, again, they are that first line of defense and can make you enjoy or um, perhaps unfortunately not enjoy as much as you could because yeah. the, the, the thing right on the end, that's why, you know, you always give someone a drink right on the end to make them happy. Uh, if they're not, then there are, you know, more things that they'll look at probably through a negative lens throughout their experience. But you bring up something interesting too, that it could be gamified. There could be some automation um, to these trainings and it leads us into technology and innovation. And, you know, Mike, I want you to, to start on that with with contactless, excuse me, contactless, cashless. Tell us more about some of the technologies that might one be fast tracked and two keep our fans safer. Yeah, I think the the technology piece uh, is is one of the more exciting pieces. But uh, as uh, just picking up on what Chris said earlier, the kiosk piece is is, a, is an unknown. We were full steam ahead, and the QSR world was leading us down a path and educating our fans and customers uh, how to order themselves and the notion of. Uh, touching anything o over and over again is is one that we're, we're going to have to see what the what the rest of the world does on that. But um, uh, the word frictionless uh, that we we hear we hear often, uh, we know that the cashless movement has been, uh, albeit a little bit slow in this country, has been has been gaining ground. Um, we see this as one of those uh, nine eleven opportunities to to put our foot on the gas and 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 take away a piece of uh, something exchanging and obviously being money back and forth. And um, and we, we already see an awful lot of venues that are looking at that differently than they did just a, a month ago. But the combination of being cashless and taking the uh, the money out of the equation um, and the notion of being contactless, we, we probably don't want a credit card moving from a customer to a fan any more than we do uh, money. So the, this notion that technology um, you know, could really be pushed forward, I think, in, in our industry and uh, without uh, some of the sensitivity optically that was getting tagged with it in different markets of who has a credit card, a debit card, who doesn't. 
I think venues have shown there, there's a way around that, but not everyone was uh, was quite willing to to take a bite of that apple. So um, we we see this as an opportunity to, as I said, really put our foot on the gas on on cashless. It's one less thing that we have to um, you know worry about in the operation, and and now's the time, and we probably won't have another hopefully a moment like this to well, we do uh, it, it is a moment yep. yeah i think that we're all taking it, this pause or break in action literally is giving us the opportunity to evaluate um you know us coming from the kind of the trade show world giving us an opportunity to look at those companies who may have the solutions and then you can also look at as you pointed out the kiosk companies who no doubt are looking into now how their products can be even safer because the, the, the notion of um, frictionless, as you pointed out, and the ease of being able to order, that's still something that we're going to want to do moving forward. It's just now um, how, how does even that technology evolve? Now, Chris, I want to ask you, that this isn't exactly innovation, but almost more so of a regression. And it got brought up a little bit earlier, and I'm curious to know what happens with recycling now because you told me something the other day, and it was like, do we have to throw everything away now? Can we still, as Tracy pointed out, recycle our water bottles? There's there's now this question of what do we do with recycling? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a huge issue. I do think with the case of water, uh, even with, with any drinks, I mean, beer in most facilities has really gotten away from draft beer anyway. So people are using packaged products, so packaged soft drinks, packaged beer, packaged water. And they now they are going, you know, at the Super Bowl, uh, they had the aluminum uh, bottles uh, for water as well as beer and cups because they're much easier to recycle that lightweight aluminum than the, the plastic. So I think you'll see a more of a push to that. But I do think you're going to see a lot of things going back to single use. And, it, you know, it goes against everything we've been trying to do, but people are wanna, gonna wanna know is once you've used that, that pan of food or utensils or whatever, if you can throw them away, it's great. The other thing, as I will say, the dishwashing companies have stepped up uh, and, and really pushed why their products, you know, temperature wise and, and chemical wise, you know, can provide the sanitation. Uh, but obviously you got more people handling it too, you know, both dirty and clean. The other thing is most venues have a relationship with local charities to donate excess food uh, after a, an event. I, you know, again, we'll see. Food hasn't been shown to, to be a carrier, but will that still occur? Will, will some of these charities uh, say, listen, we can't accept this anymore? because it's been used, your people have handled this food, and although you've taken all the precautions, we just don't want to, you know, until we know what's going on, we don't really want to get into uh, accepting, in effect, old food back. Sure, so. it gives us the opportunity to evaluate the, the donation piece of it too. I think it's a good question. Uh, we only have a minute left here, so I want to talk about removing some of the barriers and give you all maybe a, a 30 second platform here. And Mike, you already started us on something that I think, again, is very valuable to this industry and us as, uh, you know, kind of servants of, uh, you know, our markets and our industry and, and all of our partners coming back in to the venues when it's safe to do so. We play a bigger role than, than putting on games and slinging dogs and beer. Would you like to give any closing thoughts on that? No, I, 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 I think I, I, I covered most of them. We, we think the, the local piece is critical. We, we uh, we're we're optimistic that the, the, there'll be more discussion about the the, the value piece of, of of you know over the years we, we, some you know we got a little carried away right the three dollar soft drink the four dollar soft drink the five to six to seven how much higher could it go so I, I think that at least there'll be some fresh eyes on that and uh, that value of a value of a fan or we're hoping there's there's a little bit of a of, of a rethink there but. Um, you know, I, I think everyone's ready to turn the corner and start talking about, uh, you know, getting back in business. So sooner the better for us. You got that right. Um, Chris, a hurdle that we can get over together is venue and F&B partnerships. And, you know, we understand that given the situation that collectively a, a lot of our, uh, you know, partners, venue and F&B alike are, you know, might be suffering, but at a high level. And again, with our, our time winding down here, I still want you to give us kind of a high level of what might new food service agreements take into consideration that they may not have before? 
Well, flexibility, I guess, will be the key. Uh, you know, whether it's getting in the management fee contracts, but then the clients that are suffering through management fee contracts now paying bills uh, because there's no, and there's no business are going to say, I want to go back to com uh, commission agreements. I at the end of the day, we all know if it's going to work, it's got to be fair for both parties. So there's got to be give and take. You know, I expect a lot of renegotiations of extending. I've already been involved with three of them right now where the contracts were coming due and it made no sense. See, there's no way to go out to bid right now and look for proposals. So let it, let it lie for a while, give your caterer an extension and then uh, come back at an appropriate time and, and start working through it. But the biggest concern the caterers have is okay, what are the projections? I mean, they, everything's based on events and attendance. So what are the realistic projections? And until we know what that is, it's tough to tell what the financial terms are gonna be. So it's, uh, it, it's gonna be a while before anything gets normalized. I think as long as both parties say, hey, we wanna work together, we can figure, it's, it's only money, we can figure this out. Well, the hashtag of in this together, I think resonates universally right now. So we appreciate those thoughts. Uh, Tracy, I want you to kind of you know, finish this out here. Your, your bread and butter is making every meal matter. I think I took that, that quote from your website. And you know, you've studied food allergies and safety extensively, removed culinary barriers, and you've still been an advocate of that premium level of, of an experience. You know, as someone who has allergies yourself, you know, you know that a, a, an experience can begin and end with what is or isn't on the plate. So philosophically, from what you already study with coupled with what's happening now, what can we look forward to after the dust settles? Take us to, you know, home on a positive note here. I, I hope we look forward to the chefs of these culinary teams at these stadiums looking at their menus now and, and reevaluating them. How many of your items actually do are vegan or vegetarian options that aren't junk food? and you know are, are fresher and then how many of them do you have that um, that are peanut free or nut free or even soy free as well you know looking at the top eight allergens your members that are in the european union they have to label for 14 allergens already that's the european union regulation so let's learn from them how they're doing that and provide options that are free from for those attendees because you're going to get more plant-based eat more the plant-based marketplace is growing and not just from serving one of those plant-based burgers that we hear all about all the time now but what other options can you provide besides nachos and chip or nachos and cheese right elevate that level take this time to to do some vegan cooking at home and see what you can come up with that you can actually do in the kitchen at the stadiums to elevate that and i i hope that we do that along with labeling, you know, providing that information, being transparent about what's in the food and not in the food that you're serving. I think it's great. I think we all should use this time to, to think about where we go from here. Um, you know, soup to nuts, if you will, how we get our venues back to, to where they once were. So I appreciate this panel, um, probably more than they realize uh, of setting the table for us and how we ALSD can continue to, to cover this topic. So we thank you all. And again, stay tuned for, for more information. Get in touch with our panelists if you have follow-up questions for any of them. And that takes us to the end of our broadcast today. So thank you again to the audience as well to the panel.